Uh, today we're going to be looking at something. I was trying to look, I, I've had some thoughts that have been occurring to me, and so uh, I've been looking at some verses, and the topic of our, of our Bible study this morning is what I call how to be a help. And the reason that I've, I've been working on this is that sometimes, I mean, I like when I go around and I maybe attend a different church or even just come in here, that sometimes you can look around and you can see certain things, if you watch for them, that are, that are different at different churches, different ways they have of doing things. Like I'm sure in a lot of churches you go to, they probably don't have treats out in the, in the lobby as often as we do. Maybe that's not true. I guess it depends on what church you pop into, right? Uh, but I'm sure there are some that don't really have anything ever. There may be churches that don't even have coffee. Um, you know, we're blessed that we have coffee pretty much every Sunday morning, unless nobody comes that knows how to make it. I suppose that would be a possibility. Uh, and then we have treats out there fairly regularly. It helps that Simona buys her bags of flour, the big old giant, like a restaurant. <laughs> She's practically, as a matter of fact, they go to a restaurant supply to buy the stuff because at that price she can make stuff uh, often. And she's very skilled as a baker. Um, but uh, if you go around and you look at, at different churches, you're going to see definitely some different things. But one thing that's common to all the churches that you might go to or any church that starts or has existed throughout time is that no, no work of the ministry is, uh, is a single individual. It's the work of a group, right? And when we talk about things like how to be a help, um, I know some people, maybe when they look at, I don't know what Nathaniel, he's young, so he might be looking at some of the, at things and say, someday maybe, and I don't know this, I've never asked him, but some people in, in a church might think, someday I want to be a pastor. Someday I want to be an evangelist, a preacher, or something like that. Um, and some people, though, will be there and they'll look at it and they don't really want to be a preacher. They don't want to be an evangelist. They may not even feel like that they can be a Sunday school teacher, but they want to do something, right? They're motivated to do something. And that's what I call uh, being a help because at every level, no matter where you are, you're, you're really just a help. You're just doing the thing that God gave you the talent, the ability, and the motivation to do. You're applying that towards your service to Jesus Christ and God. And so when I think about things like how to be a help, just by way of an introduction to the study, what I'm talking about is you may not have aspirations someday to say, I would like to be able to get up and teach a Sunday school class, or I would like to be able to do a, a message or, or something like that. That may not be your aspiration, but there are ways that you can be a help to pastor when he's up here doing his preaching that'll go a long way. Because we all know that if, if for whatever reason, I've been to churches before where you can tell that something must be going on with the pastor because he's just not really there. You know, maybe some kind of trouble, maybe some issues that are happening in the church, maybe something that's happening personally, but there's something that's hindering the work of that man in the pulpit and keeping him from doing what he should do. I mean, I suppose it's also possible that he's just not, you know, he's, he hasn't developed to the point that he's ready for that role and he could be developing, but a lot of time it's because something maybe has happened. So to me, being a help is, is, is all about trying to find ways that we as a congregation can help pastor when he's up here in the pulpit to be uh, more prepared for the work that he has to do. You know, because that's good for us, right? If I go out to get something to eat and I go into a restaurant and I want to order, uh, you know, something, I'm trusting that the folks in the, in the, in the kitchen are skilled in how to make those items, you know? Because, I mean, I've had, I've had really good southern biscuits and gravy. Has anybody ever had biscuits and gravy? Does, does anybody not like biscuits and gravy out here? Okay, everybody likes biscuits and gravy. I've had some really good biscuits and gravy, and then I've had some, eh, some so-so biscuits and gravy, right? If I go into a restaurant and order biscuits and gravy, I'm hoping that the person in the kitchen knows what they're doing. I'm hoping that they've been provided the right quality ingredients to get the work done, right? I'm kind of putting my trust 
in them for that, so to speak. And when you go to church, you're putting your faith and your trust in the fact that the pastor also is skilled at what he's doing, that he has the right ingredients to pull everything together and prepare a message that would be a blessing to you. That's what we want when we come to church. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it's not a bad idea, and this is something maybe, maybe I should say for what we're talking about, but just by way of a, uh, finishing up the introduction, uh, it's not a bad idea to even pray that pastor have a message and that people are ready to receive it. Because the other thing I've seen in going to churches is sometimes you'll go in, and this is especially true sometimes in a meeting, and uh, you'll look at things and someone will deliver a message and it'll, you can just tell that it really resonates in the building. People really got a blessing out of it. They learned something from it. It impacted their lives in a positive way. And when that happens, the feeling in the room is different. And what's interesting about that that I've noticed is there have been times when I've been in a meeting at a church when something like that happens. And then I listen to the message later, the same one that I was in there and thought, wow, what a great message. That was just really something. And I listen to it later and it's missing something a little bit. I realized that was just the Holy Spirit moving in the room that I detected. I mean, certainly the message was important and it mattered, but what gave me that feeling, what gave everybody in the, in the building that feeling at that time to think, wow, what a great message, was it was more than the message. It was the Holy Spirit moving around and connecting things to people's hearts, right? So when I talk about being a help, it's all the things that we can do to help pastor when he's here in the pulpit, to help the church, to prepare everything that we can in a way to get people ready so that maybe this be the day that we get that kind of a blessing, right? That's being a help. So it's a help not just to pastor, it's a help to the Lord, it's a help to your fellow you know, church members. It's a help to a visitor who might be coming in. It's just being a help. So let's go into the Lord in prayer and then we'll get started. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity today. I'm not, I, I'm not thankful for why. Um, you know, we're all praying for Sam and Simona and, and everything going on right now. And just praying that, that you would give them safety in driving today. Uh, you know, they had to drive today, Lord, because surgery was Monday and you know, that's just the way it, it, it happened. I, I don't know how much of that was you, God, but I'm not, I'm not thankful for the opportunity to preach because it means pastor's gone. I'm thankful for the opportunity to preach but, and teach because it's always a privilege to do anything for you, Father. But I pray that our hearts would be not just on your word this morning, but with our pastor as he travels to Billings with Simona, his wife, and I pray you would be with them and the doctors. And I pray that, that there would be a help there, Lord, that they would just, everything would line up and, and everybody would be well rested for tomorrow and the doctors will be attentive and they'll get a special wisdom and that they'll see what they need to do and they'll have the skill to do it and that you'll give everybody comfort. And I just pray that they'll feel the Holy Spirit moving in what happens on Monday, Lord. I pray you'd give that same spirit uh, uh, moving through folks and give them peace for what's going on. And we would be motivated, Lord, to take that and learn something from it, Lord. I pray that you'd be with me so that I wouldn't make a mistake. I wouldn't say something that I shouldn't. Or if I've forgotten something that you want said, I pray you would place it in my mind at the appropriate time. But I pray also, Father, that the Holy Spirit wouldn't be hindered this morning that it would have the freedom to move about the room and accomplish the purpose you have today, Lord. And we trust that this will happen because we put our faith in you and in your son, Jesus Christ, our savior, in whose name we pray, amen. So when I first think about being a help, to me, it makes a lot of sense to think about, you know, like I, I sometimes think when I'm learning something new that I don't wanna just uh, learn the steps to do something. Sometimes it's really beneficial to learn what not to do, right? Uh, when you go, if you were to decide that you were going to uh, go bungee jumping or, or jump out of an airplane with a parachute and learn to parachute, they're going to spend some time telling you what not to do as a protection mechanism, 
right? There are certain things you just don't want to do. You don't want to be one of those guys that just says, no, I like to learn by doing, just let me get out there and I'll figure it out and eventually I'll get it down. You can do that with some things, right? If you want to learn how to take care of your lawn, you can choose to learn it the hard way and try things and, well, that didn't work, so let me try something else and uh, that kind of a thing. But when it comes to something where potentially your life is on the line, at least during that time period, most people are willing to listen to the advice of others, right? I mean, one of the things that I noticed as a father is uh, that sometimes you look at your sons and you say, I really hope that I'm allowed to relay to my sons things that they can learn from my experience so that they don't have to learn it the hard way on their own. Every father feels like that. Every mother feels like that, right? They want their kids to benefit from their experience so that they don't go through a rough time. It's not so much that they want to tell them what to do as much as they want to try to prevent the negative impact of their learning process from occurring again. Save them some trouble, right? And, uh, you know, a lot of times, the kids will sometimes be that way. Sometimes they'll take advice and they'll listen. And they'll go with it. Sometimes kids just have to learn things the hard way. I, I did at times. I didn't always take advice. I was interested in what people could tell me. And a lot of times I took their advice. But does that mean that I did everything based on folks' advice, that I didn't sometimes learn some things the hard way? No, that's not life. Sometimes we decide, I think they're incorrect. I still think this is the right thing to do. And you do it and find out, oops, it, maybe it wasn't, right? So it's beneficial to start about some things, to talk about some things, what not to do. And the first thing I want to take a look at is, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to look at some verses here to back all this up. And there, I'm going to try to hit a lot of points today uh, because this is just a lesson. So you, I would re recommend you fill in the blanks. If you know a really good verse that goes along with this that works for you, add it to your notes. But if we look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, first thing I want to look at is if we're going to be, uh, if we're going to learn what not to do, then obviously when it comes to how to be a help in the church, if you want to know what not to do, you can look at a, at an, at a person that definitely doesn't want to be a help in the church, and that would be Satan. So pretty clear, I think, and safe for me to say that if we cannot do the things that Satan does, we're on our road to being a help, right? So Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ, colon, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So Satan was an accuser of the brethren. You could, you could give Satan that title, right? He was an accuser of the brethren. So, and if you go to the book of Job, the book of Job, you can just mark down, especially the beginning where it's very specific, illustrates that perfectly. That Satan tries to find faults in you. And, you know, if you looked him at me, I, I, he's going to have an easy time. He's going to find things that I don't do correctly. And he finds those and he accuses us uh, to God. Uh, he accused, makes accusations against us before God. So he's the accuser of the brethren. Job is a great place to look to see examples of that, like I said. And if you want to be a help, then one thing you can do is you can think, if Satan is out there trying to accuse and thereby discourage the brethren, then one thing we can do is we can encourage our brethren. We can encourage folks. We can encourage them not just to keep in the work that they do, but we can encourage them that if they stumble and fall, that it's not a big deal. You know, uh, the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and gets up, Right? The point of that is you're going to make a mistake. You're going to fail at times. You're going to maybe be working at controlling your anger and maybe you're going to lose it a little bit and get upset. Those kind of things may happen, but you don't let that be the end of it. I mean, how bad would it be if Satan could just discourage us 
through an accusation right in our own mind that, hey, I thought you were working on your temper and you just got really upset at that person. What a failure. How could God want to do anything with you now? I mean, you should just quit. What good are you going to be? You can't even control your temper. You're just going to go and get mad at people like that. And he discourages first in your own mind trying to keep you from doing something by accusing you as the accuser of the brethren. You know, you ever wonder when you're beating yourself up over something? Is that you? Well, maybe it is. I mean, the flesh is pretty bad. Or is that Satan and some of his minions working with you, trying to discourage you from doing something by getting you so wrapped up in the thing that you did that wasn't great that you'll never do anything else because you just can't let it go. So if we're going to be a help, if we're not going to, if we're going to battle against Satan, the accuser of the brethren, then we should encourage one another. Which means that we should understand when people make mistakes and we should let them know, hey, I'll tell you guys through life, the one thing I know is, uh, even though I don't learn everything by uh, going, doing it the hard way and, and making a mistake and learning from the pain of, of messing up, I do learn some things like that. It is a normal process. In some ways, I learn it better because of that, right? Sometimes you do have to feel the negative consequences of something and learn from that. And that's more valuable to you than reading it because you've got a painful memory to associate with what happened. And it kind of drives it home. And the next time, maybe when you're getting ready to do that, you remember and it might help you. Or maybe you mess up again. But still, you can learn from it. You can, you can make a difference. So as an encourager, we should encourage folks to not give up when they make a mistake. We should encourage folks to not beat themselves up over things that happened in the past. I mean, can you imagine if Paul, who said he was chief of sinners couldn't get over what he did to families and Christians before he, be got, before he got saved. If he would have let that bother him, he may have never done anything in the ministry. He would have been maybe saved, but he might not have ever did anything. But he said he leaves those things behind and presses forward to the mark. You know, he's, he's, he's forgetting about those. Things. You can't change what happened. So you focus on what you can do. Focus on how you can learn from that. So don't let Satan be the accuser of the brethren for yourself or even for others. Another thing that says about Satan, if we look in, I talked about Job. If you go to Job 41, and I'll just reference this. It talks about he's a king over the children of pride. Is that in Job? I think I might have wrote the reference down wrong. Let me check this. Because that... Yeah, Job 41, 34. He, he uh, beholdeth all high things. He is king over all the children of pride. So if Satan, if, if, as, who wants to destroy the church, is all about being, you know, the, the leader of the children of pride, so to speak, you know, the king over them, then pride's a bad thing. And if we're going to be a help, we should, be, we should keep a check on our pride. Anytime we look at ourselves and say, well, I should, anytime you, you use that word I in your mind, there should be a little part of you that says, stand back and say, just check this a little bit. Be careful about what you're saying. Because that's what Satan said. Satan was like number two. He was the cherub that covereth with God. He was doing some things. I mean, well, I shouldn't say number two, but he was very important there. And uh, he let his pride get him out of control. And because of his pride, he fell. So we need to be very careful about pride in our attitudes because our pride can destroy relationships in a church. So if you want to be a help, watch your pride. Be very careful with that. We have to remember uh, that also that Satan as the God of this world and the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So when problems manifest... Are the problems really between, uh, you know, yourself and the person that, you know, you think did something against you? You know, when you, when you take offense at something somebody did, is that really where the problem was? Or doesn't the Bible say, hey, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers? What was behind that? 
right? Was it really that person? Or did Satan kind of get somebody and just get him to do this little thing that maybe got him under your skin a little bit and now you're offended with this person? Was it really the person or was Satan just trying to disrupt relationships in the church? I mean, that can happen. I've seen it. I've seen it where people come to church and you see them all the time and then someday they just aren't there anymore. And then you find out later, oh, well, this happened and they got offended. You know, the, and, and, and so they, and they couldn't get over it, so they just didn't come back kind of a thing. Little things like that can happen. It's kind of crazy to think about, you know. It's, it, it's, it, and for us, we should learn that it always boils down to if somebody gets offended, if there's contention, doesn't the Bible say, only by pride cometh contention. So if there's a problem between two people, only by pride. Because if both people were like, you know what, you know, it's fine. You can't, you can't hurt my feelings, you know, kind of a thing. Because, you know, I, I know what it's like. Sometimes I get upset or I've got something on my mind that's bothering me. Or, or I think something that somebody else doesn't think. You know, I'm just a man. You know, I, I pray to God that he opens my eyes and shows me what to do or how I should do things. But as a man, I'm sometimes going to mess up. If your attitude is, is that there's no pride, then there can't be contention and there can't be problems. So we, remember that we're not wrestling against one another, but we're, we're wrestling together against something higher, principalities and powers. You know, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we're really battling against. We're part of the team. We don't want to fracture the team. We want to keep the team together. All right, there's a lot we could look at. I guess one more thing that I'll, that I'll mention is just to keep in mind is if Satan is also, if he in that parable in Matthew is the one that when the seed is spread and they're trying to get people saved and so maybe someone comes to church and they hear the message and the seed gets out there, he's the one that steals it away from their hearts, right? Because they talked about the birds coming in and picking up the seeds and stuff, and some of it falling onto stony ground. But there's one that goes and, re- and gets the seeds and, and pulls them out. That's Satan that does that. That was how it was defined when Jesus broke that down. So we have to understand also that Satan's out there trying to steal that seed. They need enc- people need encouragement. They need to be reminded of things. They need to be encouraged that maybe if they, if you got somebody to come to church and the seed was cast and, you know, due to, you know, no fault of anybody in the building, you know, or, or in the person's home, somehow that seed was lost. Or if it, even if it fell in the stony ground, try to get them to come back. I, I don't know at what point salvation took hold on me, but I won't say that I was never exposed to it before. But I will say that I remember the day that it worked. I remember the day that it happened. So maybe I heard the gospel a hundred times before I got saved. For all I know, I just know when it took. So I'm, I'm really glad that when I got saved, that somebody invited me to go to a, a meeting that, that day. They didn't just give up because, oh, I brought him to church before and it doesn't change anything. Nothing, nothing's ever any better. So just don't give up like that. All right. Now that we've looked just briefly at, you know, knowing what not to do, let's go ahead and move on to things that we can do, which are where we can, you know, get a little bit more. And, and when I thought about this, when I was writing this part, um, at my desk where I do my work, I have these two boards up on the wall. One's a whiteboard uh, that's magnetic. So I have these little magnetic pins. And the other one's just an old standard cork board, you know, where I have the actual pins that I put in there to hold things up. And all over my boards, it's full of stuff. I got a post-it note reminding me, oh, here's this information I need because I'm always needing it. So I want it somewhere where I can just look up and go, oh yeah, that's what I need to, to do this. Or, hey, don't forget about this. I've got all kinds of things up on the board because my goal is that... Uh, that I want to I want to have quick access to information when I need it, so that it doesn't take me twice as long to do a task as it should, right? And I can't trust that I'm going to be able to always pull it out of my mind. And I kind of think of you know like when we talk about Simona being a baker, 
Uh, you know, I kind of think about that if you look at it, if your goal was in life um, that you would love to be able to bake really fancy things like a beef wellington or you wanted to make a really cool cake or something like that, that baking is really a science. A lot of people look at it as art because maybe they try to do it and they can't get it figured out and things go wrong and they don't understand. Well, I bought the cake mix, I followed the directions, but it just didn't work. When I say baking is a science, I mean that if you can control all of the variables, you will get reproducible results every single time you do it. But it, it, details matter when it talks about what you should do. It's a science because the details matter, like the exact temperature. You know, if I was teaching a class in baking, I would say you have to have something in your oven to see if it's really attaining the temperature that the dial says when you dial to 350 degrees. Is it really 350 when you set it to 350 in your oven? If it's not, you need to know that because that's going to affect the timing of things or the ability of certain things to happen. Uh, you need to pay attention to the temperature of the ingredients that you're mixing together in the room. There's a difference when you're making a cake or baking bread and it's 60 degrees in your house versus somebody who lives down south and it's 75 to 80 degrees. Bread is gonna take longer to rise in a colder environment. So that, the, and, and, and the temperature of the dough, which is affected by the temperature of the ingredients you mix together, that matters. Uh, you know, the quality of your ingredients matter. You know, if you buy really cheap flour, that's just general all-purpose flour from, from Walmart, and you try to make biscuits, and somewhere else someone buys that really good biscuit flour, then they're going to get different results than you because they paid more attention to the ingredients that went into it. So when we look at some of these things, let's remember that some of this is stuff we can jot down really quickly with notes. But just like a baker who will not only take a recipe that they work with, but because their mix of stuff is different, just like your lives are different than my life, their baking pan that they cook in is different than the baking pan that I cook in. You want to make notes about things that can help you get it just right. So, I mean, a, a professional chef or baker takes notes on the recipe because, of, like I said, because they have variances in the cookware and all that all that kind of thing. So take this and make note of it, but put some little notes off to the side that you've been able to determine yourself that'll help you be successful in applying the recipe, so to speak, to what we need to do. So the first thing, we already talked about encouraging. We know this. I'm going to read you out of uh, Romans chapter 15. You want to mark this one, Romans chapter 15. Uh, this is a really good passage on encouragement. There's a lot of them. But we're going to look at Romans chapter 15. We're going to look at five verses there, starting in verse 1, where it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but... As it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to, Jesus, according to Christ Jesus. So what it's trying to say there is you can look at Jesus Christ, our example, to see how he worked with folks, how he put himself aside for the benefit of others. How did he accomplish things? As our example, we can follow his activities and see how he did things. But when it comes to encouraging, he considered others more than he considered himself. He wasn't thinking about himself when he was on the journey to the cross. He was thinking about us. He was thinking about how his actions were going to give us an escape mechanism to get out of hell. And that's what he was focused on. 
And so as an encourager, we should look for opportunities to do things for others, even if it means that it's at the expense of ourselves. When someone brings like a treat in, for example, you know, there's some cost that comes from that, you know, especially if they're not just, you know, buying the cheapest thing. Maybe they buy really expensive ingredients and they do to make this. Maybe it takes them a lot of time to prepare that and then package it up and bring it in. I don't know. But there is an investment that they have made to do that. There's a cost to them that they do to provide that. That's an example. Maybe a person who has a garden and during the spring and summer season, they bring in flowers to the church. There's a cost to that effort to get them raised and then now they lose them out of the garden and they bring them in you know everything that we do to encourage one another is going to come at some kind of a cost to us and so we need to look for those what i think is fun is to look for opportunities to spot something that maybe nobody else has thought of before or maybe even yourself you know and sometimes like i say when i talk about going to other churches you might see hey somebody does this thing and hey, that's a really good idea nobody really does that in our church i never really thought about it before maybe i want to start doing that you never know what kind of things like that pop up in galatians chapter 5 and verse 14 it says for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So the example is, we're supposed to care about our neighbor like we care about ourselves. And if we see somebody that's struggling, they have a need, we should care as much about it for them as we would care about it if it was our need. Or our kids' need sometimes, if you're a parent. That might make sense as well. So we need to encourage one another. Uh, prayer. You know, uh, when we talk about things like prayer, it just, it, it boggles my mind just how often you'll see um, in the scriptures, if you read through the, uh, through the, the epistles and, and, you know, the New Testament, you're going to see them saying, pray for us, pray for us, pray that this, pray that that. We get prayer letters from the mission field, pray for, you know, the work, pray for all this, because prayer is important. It's important enough that Paul, who, when we think of, of a, um, you know, of, of someone out there in the ministry working early on that accomplished a lot, he, he sought prayers. Paul got a lot done, but he asked for a lot of prayer too. We can part, be a partaker in things by praying for others. Now, one thing I want to mention is that it's important that we prepare for prayer, Right? I mean, when you say, hey, would you pray for me on this? You might think, oh, it's just a simple thing. I'll just, you know, say, hey, God, please help, you know, Brother Mike, because he's got to drive. He's, he's going to Alaska again, and, and he doesn't have any trouble, right? I mean, that's praying for somebody, right? And then there's the kind of prayer where you go, man, you know, Pastor and Simone are, are going through a rough time right now. And you, you kind of meditate on it and try to think of the different things that you could pray for in regard to that. Well, it's got to be hard on the kids while they're gone. It's got to be hard on this people. How is this going to get taken care of? You can meditate on that and you can just like, uh, like I would recommend for just any part of the Christian life. I like to think of it again as going into the uh, tabernacle. What, when you go in, what's the first thing you see when you go into the tabernacle? You see that brazen altar to remind you of sin that was paid for for you. And then you've got the brass labors where you go and clean yourself. So the first thing I try to think of uh, is, is, am I in a place where God's going to hear my prayer? Am I clean? And so first you start by dealing with, with what's wrong with you so that you can reach out to God and ask him for help in a different area for another person. So part of prayer is preparation, making sure you do that. Just like you wouldn't go out on a date if you're a single guy after going and working as a fisherman all day long and you're all sweaty and smell like fish and and body odor for a whole day out in the hot sun. You're going to prepare before you go spend time with that person. Just like if you had to go meet with the president of the company that you work for as a fisherman, you're going to clean up and prepare before you go talk to him. We need to prepare before we talk to God too. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 2, it says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
So how do we bear one another's burden? Certainly we can help out, but sometimes it's just understanding their burden and praying for it. If that was you and you had to do that, what would be all the things you're concerned with? And you pray. God, I pray that, you know, that, you know, these things happen. I pray that you maybe help me figure out how I can be a help to this person in their time of need. That's part of being a help. You know, in praying for others, uh, I'll give you some examples. I had mentioned how he asked for prayer. Let me just read a couple to you. Romans 15, 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, and this is Paul, of course, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So Paul needed people's prayers. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18 praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that, and he's going to break down what he's asking for prayer on. And we need to remember this for our pastor when we pray for him. And for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So praying for pastor, we should pray that God helps him to speak boldly when he's witnessing the folks. We can pray for one another that same thing. You know, I pray that, you know, you could say, that's a great idea. I want to pray that, uh, that, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm going to pray that Nathaniel has an opportunity to speak boldly to somebody who's unsaved about salvation. That's a great prayer to make for somebody, right? It's a great prayer to make for pastor. Something that, that's really useful. It would be being a help. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and the first verse says, Finally, brethren, Pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith to, to remove those stumbling blocks. Pastor's going to run into those people that aren't going to agree with him. Maybe they aren't going to like him just because not only is he a Christian, but he's a pastor. And they may put stumbling blocks in front of him. An unreasonable man. So we can pray that God would remove that. That's something that, that, that was asked for. Finally, my last, uh, my last study point, and I'll go through this quick. I don't have time to go through all the details on it is we can find a way not only just to pray for folks, but to minister to them. Because we have to remember that we are a priesthood. Everybody, if you're saved, you're a member of the priesthood. It says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, Ye, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness, into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people. We weren't. I mean, I, did, I don't know that Fred and I would have had a lot in common if I would have bumped into Fred outside of church. Or I don't think I'd have a lot in common with anybody over here if I hadn't bumped into you outside of church, right? We're very different. Our lives, our experiences are very different. So at one time, we were not a people. Let's see, I lost my place. Uh, but, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So we need to remember that as a priesthood, then priests were always in service. Remember when I talked about the tabernacle? What's one thing that didn't exist in the tabernacle? Here's, here's a fun one for you. If you don't remember from when I did it before, you could do trivia with people. What wasn't in the tabernacle? A chair. Right? Because the priests were always doing something. There was no sitting down. So in the tabernacle, there was not a seat. So 
what can we do as priests? What can we do to help? How can we encourage? How can we make pastor's life easier? How can we express appreciation? And I won't go into details on it, but I was going to talk about that not only pastor, but even others, visitors that come to the church and stuff like that, find ways to be involved, to be of service and be a help to other people. And it's better and it's more fun if you find a way to do it where people don't know you did. That, to me, that's the funnest thing. It's, it's more fun to do something for somebody and never have them know it was you. It's just my opinion on it, right? You know, like if I was ever going to, if I knew of a family in my neighborhood that was going through a hard time and needed groceries, I don't want to pull up and, may, and come out of the car with big bags of groceries and knock on their door and bring it inside the counter. If I could figure out a way to take all those quietly and put them on the doorstep, ring the doorbell and leave, and they just open the door and there's groceries and they have no idea where they came from, I would want that. That would be more that would be more fun because then I don't have to worry that why did I do that? Did I do that so that I could get some credit or did I do it because it was the right thing to do? If if they don't know it was you, you don't have to worry about it. All you have to do is never say. <laughs> you know, oh that was really good. You know, you can put some tracks in there so they know a Christian helped them out kind of a thing. That's just a way of an example. So think about those things. I got to shut this down for now. But I think, again, I, I, why this? Because I think that we need to encourage one another. I think we're coming into a time where things are harder, more difficult, more wicked. And anything we can do to encourage one another is a good thing. And stuff. And I'm not saying it because I need encouragement. I'm saying it because I try to at times think about what are some, something that we can do to help out? How can I be more of a help? My challenge is to use to look at that. All right, um, let's go ahead and take a break here.